Hello, and thank you for joining me for this plenary talk as part of the sixth Subrogan International Conference on Foreign Language Teaching. My name is Martin East, and I'm Professor of Language Education at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. I would like to say a special thanks to Thomas Tinnefeld for his kind invitation to present a plenary at this virtual conference. Two years ago, I was able to take part in the fifth Saarbrücken conference in Germany, and I appreciated the opportunity to interact face to face with everyone who was able to be at the conference. However, within a few months of returning home to New Zealand, the COVID pandemic began, and the rest, as they say, is history. It's freut mich aber, diese Gelegenheit zu haben, bei der Fremdsprachentagung teilzunehmen. I hope you will enjoy this plenary talk where I explore the interface between communicative competence and intercultural communicative competence. I'd like to start this presentation by posing the question, what is the purpose of learning an additional language? We could answer that question in a host of ways, but contemporary understandings of the main purpose of learning a new language tend to focus on communication, that is, People learn languages so that they can communicate with people who speak that language in a range of different contexts. If we consider communication to be the primary goal of language learning, that has implications for how languages should be taught and the components that we consider to be indispensable. In other words, we're interested in helping students to become effective communicators. And that requires thinking about what courses need to include. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is to address the skills that language learners and language users need if they are to be communicating successfully across national, linguistic and geographic borders. The theme of this conference. The concept of communicative language teaching emerged in the 1970s. It represented a distinct move away from more grammatically oriented and structure based courses that were based on principles such as grammar translation and focused on those who were learning languages because they actually needed to use them in genuine communicative contexts. Traditionally, the communicative agenda has been interpreted and enacted from a linguistic perspective. And building on formal models such as grammar translation and also audiolingualism, the focus of courses has been on the language that students need to acquire in order to communicate. So a key question to address in this presentation is, is this sufficient for effective communication across borders? Communicative approaches to language teaching and learning have been informed by several different theoretical frameworks. And I think that one framework in particular presents key elements of what it means to communicate proficiently or competently in another language. That's the Canali and Swain model. This was a model that was developed around the 1980s as a means of consolidating thinking around the aspects of language acquisition that had begun to emerge from the 1970s that were considered to be important for communication. The model has been developed and superseded by others, but I still think that the Canali and Swain model remains a succinct interpretation of the key elements of what it means to communicate competently. Canali and Swain com conceptualized communicative competence as having four key components. The first of these components was grammatical or formal competence, which covers knowledge of systematic features of grammar, lexis, and phonology. Canali and Swain argued that if you were going to communicate competently or effectively in an additional language, it was important that you had an understanding of the grammar or the rules and how those rules should be applied in communicative contexts. Next came sociolinguistic competence or knowledge of the rules of language use in terms of what is appropriate to different types of interlocutors in different settings and on different topics. In other words, sociolinguistic competence recognized that the context in which we might be using language to communicate differed. The type of language we might use in talking with our friends is quite different to the type of language we might use in talking to a lawyer or a police officer. Sociolinguistic competence was therefore the knowledge of the appropriate language to choose and knowing how to apply that appropriate language in different contexts. Discourse competence was the ability to deal with extended use of language in context. In other words, under this model, it wasn't considered sufficient just to be able to know individual words and phrases, even though those phrases might be useful 
for the beginnings of communication. To be regarded as competent in communicating in another language, there was the need to be able to deal with extended use. For example, being able to read a whole newspaper article, or listen to a lecture, or perhaps deliver a speech. So discourse competence is concerned with the connection of a series of sentences or utterances to form a meaningful whole. Discourses have a global meaning that is greater than the sum of the individual sentences or utterances that constitute the text. And if we are to communicate competently, we need to have an understanding of that greater whole. Finally, under their model came strategic competence. This was the ability to compensate in performance for incomplete or imperfect linguistic resources in a second language. In other words, what you do when you don't know something. And here Canali and Swain were thinking of the strategies that interlocutors might use to enable communication to continue when it hits a problem. It might include, for example, asking the person you're talking to to repeat what they've said, or to slow down their speech, or to rephrase something. Anything that can enable the communication to continue when it has started to break down. These four elements, then, formed the basis of what Canali and Swain argued was meant when we talk about somebody who can communicate competently in an additional language. And these four elements have informed the development of communicative language teaching, the language teaching approach that focuses on helping learners to communicate in the target language. And in CLT models, the goal of teaching becomes to help learners to develop their ability to take part in the process of communicating through language, rather than to insist on their personal perfect mastery of a language's individual structures. Now knowing the grammar may be a useful step towards the process of communicating, but it's essentially what learners can do with their knowledge of language in order to communicate. So in the UK, for example, the introduction of CLT in the early 1970s marked a significant shift away from a linguistic and grammatical emphasis, as represented through approaches like grammar translation and audiolingualism. And in its place, the emphasis became what Hedge described as what it means to know a language and to be able to put that knowledge to use in communicating with people in a variety of settings and situations. In a parallel development in the US at the start of the 1980s, we saw the development of what Claire Cramsh referred to as the proficiency movement or the proficiency-oriented curriculum. And this development was built on the argument that language is primarily a functional tool, one for communication. For Cramsh, this view on language teaching and learning carried with it an implicit assumption that the final justification for developing students' proficiency in a foreign language is to make them interactionally competent on the international scene. Students therefore needed to learn the ability to function effectively in the language in real-life contexts. This theoretical and methodological stance, informed by theories of communicative competence, has served us well from around the 1970s until the present day. And that's a long and very successful history. But, for several decades now, a key shortcoming to communicative approaches has been identified. Lydicott argued, a language learner who has learned only the grammar and vocabulary of a language is not well equipped to communicate in that language. In his view, learners require cultural knowledge as much as they require grammar and vocabulary. For Lydicott, therefore, the two went hand in hand. Yes, it was first a question of understanding the language and being able to use the language communicatively, but alongside that needed to be the cultural knowledge that would help with the effectiveness of the communication. Screener and Crichton maintained that language users need to be able to negotiate meanings across both languages and cultures. And their argument here was therefore not just on the negotiation of linguistic meaning, but also on the negotiation of cultural meaning, or making different cultural perspectives understandable in communicative contexts. In fact, Claire Cramsh has been one of the key theorists and researchers who's argued for the importance of the intercultural dimension in language learning. And her understanding of interactional competence carries with it vital messages about the interface between language and culture. Cramsh gave a very useful illustration. She drew on a very familiar language learning episode, the example of a customer ordering the legendary cup of coffee in a French restaurant after three years of French. In other words, Ordering a cup of coffee in a restaurant 
is a very typical exercise for language learners to do in language classrooms through some kind of role play and requires them at the very least to have learned particular items of vocabulary and phrases that might help them to be able to communicate successfully and therefore purchase the cup of coffee. Easy, right? Know the words, practice the phrases, and voila, as they say in France. Coffee delivered. But what if you can't make yourself understood? Kramsch argued that the challenges you may encounter are most likely not due to not knowing the right grammar and vocabulary or not knowing the basic behavioural rules. After all, after three years of learning French, it's highly likely that from a linguistic perspective, students will have developed a high level of competence in being able to order a cup of coffee in a French restaurant. Kramp suggested that if you're struggling to make yourself understood, more probably the challenges come down to something more than language. I'll let you read what Crouch proposed. And in something I wrote in 2016, I summed up the dilemma with these words. Brown argued, a language is a part of a culture, and a culture is a part of a language. The two are intricately interwoven so that one cannot separate the two without losing the significance of either language or culture. From this perspective, therefore, language and culture need to be two equal parts of the language teaching and learning endeavour. So an important element in developing intercultural competence through learning an additional language is to recognise that language carries with it cultural assumptions and cultural messages. And sometimes these cultural assumptions and cultural messages are embedded or implicit. But effective communication across borders depends on a level of understanding of these embedded and implicit messages. So what I'd like to do now is to give an illustration using a very short video clip. The video clip I'm going to show you is an animated clip that shows a Skype conversation between two exchange students. One of those exchange students is Jürg. He comes from Germany, but is spending a year in New Zealand. Duncan, on the other hand, comes from New Zealand, but is spending a year in Germany. And in this clip, Jürg and Duncan share some of their struggles adapting to life in another country and understanding what is being said to them. This clip actually forms part of a complete series known as Life Swap that is available in the public domain from any one of these three websites. As you watch this clip, and the clip lasts about five minutes, I'd like you to think about any examples of how full understanding of language is hindered by inadequate understanding of embedded cultural assumptions. In other words, what examples of language also appear to require an understanding of culture if they are to be fully understood? Nah. I'm pretty sure you can't disagree with me already, Jürg. I haven't said anything yet. Nein, Duncan. Na is a German greeting. It means, so how is it all going, my close friend? Oh, I get you. Well, that's a lot to pack into one small word. What should I say back? The answer is also, na, which means, yes, not so very bad, all things considered. It's special that you are here, but in a low-key way. And how are things for you, not just now, but in general? Jeez, Jürg, I might just stick to Guten Morgen for a while if that's okay with you. Hey, I see on Facebook that you've got some new mates. Yeah, we made a party. It was very funny. But I have some questions for you about that. I think it's time you gave up on those folders now, Jürg. Look at you, drinking local craft beer. Wearing only a t-shirt featuring a stylized New Zealand map despite freezing conditions and taking part in the spontaneous midnight hacker. It's all there, Jürg. You have achieved full cultural integration. Who's your mate? I met Chris on the first day of university, but it was months before I received the first invitation. Why did it take so long? Hmm, it could have been any number of things, Jürg. Were you too direct? Nee, auf keinen Fall. Hab sogar deine Anweisung dabei gehabt. Excuse me, 
Sorry, would it maybe possibly be okay for me to sit in the seat? Sounds okay so far. What happened next? Well, at the end of the lecture, he asked the usual questions. Where I come from, if I've ever been on the Oktoberfest. And then he said, You should come around for dinner sometime, Joe. Yeah. The next two weekends I'm away, but Sunday the 2nd at 19 o'clock works for me. Uh, yeah, I see your problem. Was his answer, sure, I'll get back to you on that. Yes, but he never did. After that day, we are seeing us many times in class, but for months, no invitation. Yeah, nah, the diary thing might have scared him off a bit, Jürg. But he asked me to his house for dinner. Should I memorize my schedule? Nah, look. You technically that wasn't an invitation. Why not? Well, what he said was, you should come round for tea sometime. Note he is using the subjunctive, should. In other words, you should come round for tea, but you won't. Because we both know we have only just met and it would be weird. There's so much subtext in your country. The other clue is the phrase, sometime. In New Zealand, some time is a mythical point of time in the future. It cannot be put in a diary, Jurg, because it usually turns out to mean never. Except in the rare cases when you happen to see each other a few more times by chance and decide that you actually like each other, at which point an event in real time may ensue. In summary, Jurg, you should come round for dinner sometime as Kiwi for you seem quite nice. And what is the correct reply, please? The answer must also be in the subjunctive, and is said in an animated way. Yeah, that would be really nice. Subtext, I understand that this event will never happen, but were it to take place, it would be a hypothetically enjoyable occasion. That explains the months of awkward smiling. But when the real invitation finally came, it was very strange. Hey, Jerk, how's it going? Hey. Some of us in the tutorial group are going to have tea together tomorrow night at my place to celebrate the end of term. You should come along. Bring a plate. Oh, mean. Score. No one explained to me that tea means dinner, Duncan. I thought I was invited for a cup of tea. Maybe Dilma or a nice herbal. I just didn't understand what the plate was for. It turned out I was meant to bring food on the plate, Duncan. Bring a plate is a potluck dinner, Jurg. I like to think of the potluck as the cornerstone of the New Zealand community dining scene, bringing together old and young in a relaxed domestic setting. It also brings cheap quiche, curry and pasta salad together on a small paper plate. In Germany, we like to plan our meals. We would never mix these things together. I have another one of these potlucks today. Oh, you can't go wrong with an apple crumble, Jürg. It's cheap and easy to make. I'll ask Ange to show you how to make one. Oh, dann muss ich jetzt aber anfangen. Es fängt um sieben an. Oh, don't turn up on time, Jürg. It's not like in Deutschland. Potlucks are pretty, you know, cash. Cash? Yeah, cash. You know, it's like the casual way of saying casual. Oh, that's a good one. How do you spell it? Oh, you don't spell it, Jürg. That would kind of defeat the purpose. Oh, okay. Dann bis später. There's a lot that we could actually unpack from that short video clip. I'll just focus on a couple of examples. From the German language and culture perspective, Duncan misinterprets the German na for the New Zealand na. Let's unpack his dialogue with Jörg about that. In response to Jörg's na, Duncan says, I'm pretty sure you can't disagree with me already, Jörg. I haven't said anything yet. Duncan therefore misinterprets Jörg's greeting as a negation of what he said. Jürg explains, Nein, Duncan. Na is a German greeting. It means, so how is it all going, my close friend? And Duncan responds, That's a lot to pack into one small word. What should I say back? Jürg continues, The answer is also na, which means, yes, not so very bad, all things considered. It's special that you are here, but in a low-key way. And how are things for you, not just now, but in general? A very small word, carrying with it particular cultural understandings, 
that Duncan is not familiar with. So Duncan concludes, I might just stick to Guten Morgen for a while if that's okay with you. And here we see a small example of how Duncan is uncomfortable with how a particular piece of language is being used culturally and therefore deciding that it might be best for him to be going back to something more familiar at least until he develops a greater understanding of the cultural implications of the language he's being asked to use. And what about the English language culture perspective? One example given is the phrase, you should come round for dinner sometime. And Duncan deconstructs parts of the sentence linguistically. Should is subjunctive. Sometime is a vague time expression. And then Duncan unpacks the embedded cultural assumptions hidden within the language. Technically, he says, that wasn't an invitation. You should come round for tea, but you won't, because we both know we've only just met, and that would be weird. Duncan continued, the other clue is the phrase sometime, a mythical point in time in the future that cannot be put in a diary, because it usually turns out to mean never. So Duncan sums up, you should come round for dinner sometime, is Kiwi for you seem quite nice. However, again, it's important to understand the cultural assumptions that are embedded in and lay behind the use of language. This is not a specific invitation for an event that will take place. Rather, it is a means of communicating the beginnings of a level of familiarity and friendship. So the correct response, as suggested by Duncan, the answer must also be in the subjunctive and is said in an animated way. Yeah, that would be really nice. Subtext, I understand that this event will never happen but were it to take place, it will be a hypothetically enjoyable occasion. Once more, implicit cultural assumptions lying behind the use of language. And not fully understanding those cultural assumptions means that the language itself is misunderstood. So these humorous examples illustrate several key points. Language and culture are interrelated. Language carries meanings that need to be interpreted in light of implicit cultural understandings. Communication fails when the language at the individual word level is generally understood, but the implicit cultural understandings are not. Underpinning all of this is the reality that two people engaging in a conversation, the interlocutors, each come into that conversation with different understandings about themselves, their worlds, and their places in those worlds in relation to others. How then do we navigate the intercultural divide in the context of learning and using an additional language? One way of theorizing this is the notion of intercultural communicative competence. And intercultural communicative competence is more than knowing facts about the target culture, no matter how useful those facts might be. One way of describing intercultural competence is to understand it in terms of striving for the third place. And in this conceptualization, the first place represents the culture and identity of the language learner, who I am and what I bring at this moment into my interaction with you. The second place represents the culture and identity of the target language speaker, who you are and what you bring in at this moment into your interaction with me. The third place is the space in between. It recognizes values and is comfortable with both who I am and who you are in the interaction. So in practice, Lidicott and Crozy suggest that teaching the target language becomes teaching learners how to make their first culture relate to the target culture in a way which can free them from a monocultural view of the world. Language learners interacting with others are not being asked to abandon their own thoughts, feelings and values and assimilate themselves to the thoughts, feelings and values of their interlocutors. Rather, they're being asked to reach an accommodation between their own culture and personality and the new culture. The end goal is to reach a third place, a comfortable, unbounded and dynamic space which intercultural communicators create as they interact with each other and in their attempt to bridge the gap between cultural differences. As Piotrkowska asserted, learners face obstacles in relating with others stemming from differences between cultures. Much of our cultural behavior is invisible to us and applied in everyday interactions with other people. And intercultural communication needs to be able to decenter oneself from one's own perspective and cultural context in order to take the perspective of one's interlocutor to negotiate cultural meanings, solve cultural problems, and mediate between cultures. Jürgen Duncan had tentatively begun that process 
but they still had quite a way to go. Both were still very much operating from a first place perspective. So from communicative competence to intercultural communicative competence. And from communicative language teaching to intercultural communicative language teaching. A model of language teaching that will lay culture alongside language, but not just from the perspective of facts about the target culture, but from the perspective of how language and culture interrelate and what that means for effective communication. This is all very well in theory. There are challenges in practice. Indeed, a recurring theme of the international literature is just how difficult it appears to be to integrate an intercultural dimension into language programs. In the European context, for example, Brunsmeier spoke of the development of language learners' intercultural competence as a big challenge. This, it was suggested, was due to vague theoretical conceptions of a construct that has not yet been clearly defined for young learners. In the Australian context, Kohler recognised the immense struggle that teachers encountered as they sought to integrate culture into language classrooms. Another study highlighted the huge gap that exists between theory and practice. Putting an intercultural orientation into practice in many classrooms was, it seemed, still at a rudimentary stage and happening at a pace that was almost glacial. In New Zealand, Kennedy argued that if intercultural capabilities are to be developed among language learners, there needed to be intentional, i.e. discrete time for intercultural comparison and reflection in classrooms. This needed to be above and beyond the language teaching and learning experience. She continued, without explicit inclusion of intercultural pedagogies during class involving, for example, discussing, comparing, connecting outside experiences with those in the classroom and reflecting, the skills, knowledge and traits which make up intercultural competence are not likely to evolve. Putting the intercultural dimension into practice in language classrooms requires teachers to deliberately change their own classroom practices. This possibility, it seems, remains to be explored beyond the level of passive recognition. Teachers may recognise that they need to do this, but at the moment they haven't taken that many steps towards deliberately changing their practices. As I conclude, I just wanted to briefly mention a study that I recently concluded with a team of other academics in New Zealand. And this will become a book that will be published next year by Springer in the Intercultural Communication and Language Education series. In our two-year study, we as researchers worked with five teachers working in intermediate schools in New Zealand, that is schools with students in the 11 plus to 12 plus age range. And we looked at how intercultural exploration might be embedded into teaching and learning of an additional language. The book will be available gold open access next year and therefore fully accessible and I'll leave that to you if you wish to delve deeper into the project and its findings. However, we did outline some principles with which I'd just like to conclude in this presentation. Based on our findings and also in the light of findings of other studies, several things became apparent. Teachers need time to invest in planning and to research the content they wish to use for intercultural reflection. And if intercultural communicative language teaching is to be effective, there needs to be this investment of time and research. Teachers would benefit from professional development opportunities that demonstrate how language and culture can be taught and woven together. Also, linguistic resources are needed that present intercultural aspects particularly those that might trigger exploration of difference across languages and cultures. Teachers and students should also be encouraged to be open-minded and reflect on their own culture, values and beliefs. In summary, here are just a few of the quotes that I've drawn on earlier in this presentation. The challenge, it seems, is how to make this work more effectively at the level of the language classroom. Thank you. And now I'm open for some questions.